based on all that's going on, I thought I would change a little bit. Uh, well, the sermon's not going to change. We're going to keep chugging through 1 Corinthians 4, but the introduction did change. Um, I'm simply going to go ahead and use today as a, a form of commitment to you, uh, as a form of promise to you. Uh, there are these rare moments in Scripture where Paul is talking about himself as a preacher or a pastor or a minister. And so when we get to these rare moments, it's kind of an awkward sermon because I'm preaching to you about me. Uh, I'm preaching to you about the, the pastors of our church, in this case, ministers at large. And, and so based on what's going on, I thought it would be a very, very perfect Sunday to simply recommit to you some things that will never change. Uh, in this pulpit, and from your pastors. And so, if you have your Bible, open it with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 4. <clears throat> and let's go ahead and jump back in and kind of pick up steam with where we've been uh, the last few weeks. Uh, obviously, if you are watching online, welcome. If you're watching over there in the family room, uh, in the overflow, welcome. Uh, we are glad that you're here as well. But if you also would take your Bibles and open them with us to 1 Corinthians 4, we would appreciate that. As we're going to have basically one hand on the, the, the scripture and another hand here pointing, I guess today, not at you, but more at me. So I'll be preaching with one hand on the text and one hand pointing at myself uh, and, of course, all of the other pastors and ministers of the gospel. I'm going to talk about the minister's role, the minister's requirement, and the minister's reward. And I really can think of nothing more important today than for pastors to start standing up and preaching the full counsel of God's word. Uh, this is an absolutely pregnant call, a clarion call for the day in which we live, especially here in California. And so if you have your Bible, pick it up with me there in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 1. And let me go ahead and just give you a little bit of background on what we're going to call the minister's role. When you think of a pastor, uh, what do you think of? When you think of a minister of the gospel, what do you think of? Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about what maybe society thinks of. How do you picture uh, these guys who get up here on Sunday morning and open the Bible, sometimes, less and less actually, and begin to teach and begin to proclaim. Paul says his role in chapter 4, verse 1 is this. He says, let a man, meaning the, the Corinthian church, regard us or esteem us or think about us or view us in this manner. And that, that's kind of your context for this morning's study. Uh, remember that Corinth had had all these big wig personalities, the personality cults and the big egos coming through. We talked a little bit you know, weeks back about kind of picture Elon Musk down at Saddleback and everybody's flocking to these churches and they're, they're, they're grabbing on to which, which, which guy they're going to follow. Paul right here is trying to, to reorient the church's understanding of what a minister of the gospel is supposed to be. And so he says, here's how you're supposed to view them. And he says... As number one, look at this, a servant of Christ, and number two, a steward of the mysteries of God. So there's two statements there that define the, the very heartbeat of a minister. It doesn't mean there's not more. I mean, the, the pastoral epistles unfurl those. There's 42 different uh, parts of the job description. There, there's 22 different qualifications. So there's a lot more, but this is the heart of it. And notice he says two things. Number one, he's a servant of Christ. And number two, he is a steward of the mysteries of God. So let's just go ahead, if you have a pen, and underline those. And let's just work through each one of them. Number one, he's a servant of Christ. You go, well, well Tony, you're up on stage this morning. I know there's other pastors at Mission Bible, but today you're the one up there. So, so I want to know who you are and, and, and what you're doing as a, as a pastor, as a minister of the gospel. Well, there it is. Number one, he says a minister of the gospel is a servant. Now, that word servant is interesting because uh, it, it's the, the word in Greek for the under rower. A lot of you know this, but just kind of go with me again and review. The under oarsmen. See, Corinth was on an isthmus, and so they would take these boats instead of sailing down around the peninsula and risking their life, and they would put them three, four miles on these logs, and they would take these warships, and they would push them along the logs to the other side. So all the Corinthians knew uh, what an under oarsman was. And if you've ever seen the old movies uh, where they've got guys in the bottom of the boat and there's the oars on either side and there's a row of benches and they're, they're rowing and there's a captain up top and he's saying, pull, pull, pull. You know that whole thing? That's the imagery here. 
So Paul says, number one, we're not big shots. We're not high and mighty. We're not to be lauded as somebody that's special. The minister of the gospel is, number one, he's an under oarsman. I mean, he's down there at the bottom of the barrel. He's low man on the totem pole. He's the guy who's serving for a living. He obeys orders from one captain. He doesn't even get to get up. He's chained. He does nothing without the order coming from the captain. He, he's down there, and he's the hardest working guy on the boat. A fascinating description. In fact, in 2 Corinthians, he goes on and he says, in chapter 6, verse 3, in order that the ministry be not discredited, but in everything, we commend ourselves as servants of God. And then he goes on describing in much endurance, afflictions, hardships, distresses, and beatings, imprisonments, tumults, and labors, and sleeplessness, and hunger, and purity, and knowledge, and patience, and kindness, and the Holy Spirit, and love. He says in everything that he does, it's commending himself to the captain, saying, I just want to please Christ. And then number two, look at this. He moves on and he says, as servants of Christ, and then number two, here's the second description, and stewards of the mysteries of God. He's a steward, number two, of the mysteries of God. Now, before you get caught up on mystery there, it doesn't mean like a scary movie mystery. What it means is that truth that God had kind of held to himself, and then he slowly was revealing over the course of history, it's a minister's job to make sure that people, and here's the other word, steward, they, they receive that truth. Um, the way to picture it, steward in your mind might be, you remember before flight attendants were called flight attendants, they were called stewards and stewardesses? I don't think we use that anymore. It's probably politically correct because everything is politically incorrect, right? But that was the old term. And the idea was that you had this man or this woman, they would go down the aisle, remember, and they would dispense a beverage or dispense a meal. That's the best way to picture this. He says the preacher's job is to constantly be dispensing the revealed truth of God. I'll just give you a few of these from the New Testament, okay? Uh, the mystery of the kingdom would be one. The mystery of the kingdom uh, would be, Jesus called it that, the idea that God is ultimately working, Christ is going to come, Christ came, Christ is going to return, and that God is working in the world through Christ. Mark 4.11, and he was saying to them, to you it has been given the mystery of the kingdom of God. Meaning the disciples, they were to go out and teach that. Here's another one. Uh, the mystery of lawlessness, you might have heard that, the mystery of iniquity. 2 Thessalonians 2.7, you're just the idea that why is the world always so messed up? Well, it's a minister's job to tell you that. Why is the human dilemma constantly recycling and nobody can ever get out of their own way? Some of us go, well, this is the worst it's ever been. You study history and you go, no, nope, not the worst it's ever been. There's nothing new under the sun. And it's the pastor's job to make sure that you, you know that so you don't become hopeless. 2 Thessalonians 2.7, for the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Of course, Paul goes on there to talk about the coming Antichrist and the ultimate iniquity, but he's saying this is just the way that it is. Uh, the mystery of the kingdom, the mystery of lawlessness, another time it's used is the mystery, the mysterion, it's called the revealing of godliness. In 1 Timothy 3.16, great is the mystery of godliness, talking about Christ, that he was revealed in the flesh, vindicated in the spirit, beheld by angels, proclaimed among the nations, believed in the world, taken up in glory. It's simply the idea of godliness is, is, is that you can actually overcome the world. You can walk in righteousness. You're not conformed to it. You're in the world, but not of the world because you're in Christ. And there's a union in Christ. And so it's a pastor's job to explain that to you as a believer. Of course, the mystery of the church. Uh, this new society where every nation, tongue, and tribe is pulled out of the four corners under a new temple of being a new body of the living God unto his eternal praise and glory forever, Ephesians chapter 3, verse 4 and 5. And so all of that is the pastor's, the minister's job to be teaching to you. Now, let me go ahead and pause right there and just let's have a moment of just authentic, good, honest pastor to pew, pulpit to pew discussion. What this means is that you should never in any way fear your pastors. You should never fear your ministers. I mean, you should never feel like you got to walk on eggshells around pastors. So sometimes I, I, I feel that way, you know, a little bit. People, and, and I go, well, where does that come from? You can honor pastors, you can respect pastors, you can, you can care about ministers and applaud ministers, that's fine, but you don't need to fear them because all they are is, is fellow servants of Christ. That's it. 
See, see some people feel like they've got to almost be like, 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 like reverent around, around pastors. Now, let me tell you where that comes from. That's actually a holdover. You ready for this? From the Roman papal system and the way that the, the pope was always venerated. It's part of the popish carryover. And that's why a lot of times, by the way, if you come from a Catholic heritage, even though you're no longer Catholic, you're still going to have moments where you feel a little bit nervous around your pastor. And when I go door-to-door -door evangelism all the time, I'll knock on a door, and if they're a Catholic family and I say that I'm a pastor, they always listen to me. <laughs> and I take advantage of it. I pull out my collar. No, I don't really do that. <laughs> I, but I do. They, they have to listen because they've been told since they were this big that, it, that that's the man that can get you into heaven or not. I make my kids call me father in front of me. <laughs> So what you're experiencing, if you have that, whether it's cultural, whether it's from movies, or whether it's from a Catholic heritage, is a, it's a carryover from the, the popish system, right? But there's another one. It's more modern. It's the advance and the rise, ready, of the hyper-charismatic groups, where some of you are taught since you were little that there's a, a special man. It's kind of the honor system, they call it. He's a father in the faith, and he has more of an in with God and so you need to show respect for him because he hears better from God than you do. And that's because hypercharismatic churches aren't teaching based off biblical revelation, what the authority of Scripture say, but off of personal manipulation, what they say. See the difference? Whereas biblical authority would simply say what Paul just said, I'm a servant, you're a servant, our job is to open up the word and whatever it says, that's what we do. You're not submitting to me, you're submitting to this. That makes sense? Okay? And the sad reality is that nobody will ever serve right until he sees himself right. So a minister of the gospel needs to remember he works for Christ. You know, we're, we're not here to preach what you want to hear. We're here to preach what Christ once said. Because we serve him. And by the way, is my role as a primary teacher, um, based on gifting and what the other pastors want me to do, as long as you keep wanting me to do it, what that means is, is that I, I need to be able to give you a full meal every Sunday. That when you come here on a Sunday, you should be demanding a full meal. And if you find that I'm spending the majority of my time on the golf course, if I'm out at the, you know, the welfare pantry, if I'm spending all my time picketing on whatever the social issues are, even in the counseling office, that at some level I become an abject failure to you because a minister's job is to open up the Bible and make sure that you're stewarded the mysteries of God. And now he emphasizes that in verse 2. Look at this. He goes from the role, look at this, to the minister's requirement. Look at this. In verse 2, he just doubles down. More over. More over. I mean, even more than this, in addition to this, it is required of stewards... The context there, the stewards of the mystery. That one be found, and what does your Bible say? Trustworthy. Trustworthy to what? Trustworthy to the teaching of the, the Bible. Trustworthy to the teaching of the scriptures. Trustworthy to the stewardship of the, the mysteries. That's, that's the role. He says it's required of him, right? The idea there is of a, a ledger and the accounting books, and you would put that in front of the boss, and he would see if if everything added up. He says, one day you're going to stand before the captain. He's going to see, did you treat my truth well? And so uh, right there, friends, let me go ahead and point the finger um, at every man who preaches. You ready? There's one thing the minister is going to be judged on, and that is faithfulness in the pulpit. I'm, I'm, I'll personalize it just for the sake of clarity. I'm not going to be judged when I get to heaven based off of the, my relevance. I'm not going to be judged based off my humor. I'm not going to be judged based on my creativity. I'm not going to be judged based off the technology. I'm not going to be judged based on number of converts. And I'm not going to be judged even on the size of the church. I'm simply going to be judged on whether or not and how I opened up the book. Did you take the truth of God and give it to the people of God? Did you feed them the manna of God? Did you give them the revelation of God? Did you take the bread, the living bread, and cast it before them so that the sheep could feed, yes or no? That is the job of God's minister. That's what it says. In 2 Corinthians 2.17, Paul goes on, he says, We're not like many peddling the word of God. That means giving it in such a way that people will like you. 
but it's from sincerity, it's from God. We speak Christ. In 2 Corinthians 4, 2, he goes on, he says, We have renounced the things hidden because of shame, not walking in craftiness or adulterating the word of God, but by the manifestation, the showing forth of truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. Famously, he wrote to Timothy, his young protege, in 2 Timothy 4, 1, and he said, I solemnly charge you. I solemnly charge you. I mean, get that. He says, I'm not just charging you. I'm solemnly charging you. In the presence of God in Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead and by his appearing in his kingdom, preach the word. Correction, ton, lagan. You don't get up there with your shows and you don't get up there with your gimmicks. You don't peddle the gospel. You preach the word, he says. In James 3, James says, listen. Let not many of you become teachers, my brother, knowing that as such, you're going to incur a stricter judgment. I mean, young men, if you're in the room and you're going, maybe one day I want to do that, you better hold on. Because you need to understand the moment that you stand up and say, I'm going to teach the Bible, you're going to be held to a stricter judgment by God for your teaching of his book. So you walk into it humbly. You walk into it with trembling knees. You walk into it with a prayerful disposition. And you make sure that you put your time in in the study so that when you stand up here, you know beyond a shadow of a doubt that what you're saying is true. Uh, we had a gal who came up just, um, I don't know what it was, a couple of weeks ago. Oh, bless her heart, gracious gal, 25-ish in that ballpark. And she came up and she, she said, I, I think she was at one of the weddings. I think it was Brooke's wedding. And so she came to church the next Sunday and she came up and she said, I have been church searching for about a year. An entire year. I said, well, why? She said, because I, I just simply am a sheep that wants to be fed, and I'm hungry, and nobody opens up the Bible anymore. She's 25. Looking for churches because there's a famine in the land, and she says, I just am a hungry, emaciated sheep, and I, I don't want gimmicks. I just want the book. Someone explain it to me, please. See, see, friends, this verse right here, in fact, you got a pen, put an asterisk next to it in your Bible, and just write this. This little verse, one verse, it is a prescription to so many ailments and diseases in the evangelical church. It's a prescription for it, right? All, all men have to do is preach the Bible. That's it. i got a quote here from Rick Warren. Rick Warren, on an interview in 2003, said, quote, At our church, we, we've used film clips, and we've used um, dramas, and we have used object lessons. And one of my favorite features is called point and play, where we separate sermon points by, by secular music. We always do this at Easter and Christmas Eve. I learned this when I was a consultant on the DreamWorks movie, and I noticed something on the wall. I was on the DreamWorks movie, The Prince of Egypt. One day when I was in the hall at DreamWorks, and I noticed something on the wall called an emotional beat chart, and they monitor the emotional highs and lows of a movie, and so at Saddleback, we thought that we could do that too, end quote. Here's another quote from D.A. Carson. In the West, quote, pastors need to repent of their endless fascination with these models. The models of being the CEO, the models of being in a power ploy, the, the models of the title senior or junior pastor, the model of surveys and polls and scratching every emotional itch of a congregation. All valid leaders, despite their style, must remember that they have been entrusted with the display of the singular and only gospel truth, end quote. When you go to a church, friends, you have to demand that the Bible is opened. You have to demand that a man preaches with one finger on the text and one finger at you. Paul closes here, look at this, by giving us the reason why. He goes from the role to the requirement to the reward. Look at this in verse 3. To the reward. He says, here's why I do what I do as a minister of the gospel. He says, but to me, 
And, and notice that he doesn't care about what anyone thinks. He, he's not concerned with the right or the left. He's not concerned with anybody. There's no fear of man in Paul. He says in verse 3, here's the thing I'm focused on. But to me, it is a very small thing that I should be examined by you or by any human court. In, in fact, I don't even examine myself. Now, it's important to notice there, friends, that he, he's not talking, very, very important to understand this, he's not talking about actions there when he says, I don't examine these things. He's talking about motives. We, we know Paul cared a lot about actions. I mean, he's, a chapter from now, he's going to be blasting a man in the church who's, who's sinning. He talks a lot in Romans 7 about his own sin. He, he's not, if you got sin, deal with it. He's talking about, about motives, right? The idea that, um, you know what I'm preaching? I know you don't ever do this, right? But you know what I'm preaching, what you're actually thinking in your mind is, I know what he really means. You don't ever do that. I, I, know, I, I never do that to you. Like when I'm preaching, I, I promise, I never think this is what Adam's really thinking. I know what he's really up to, right? Jack, I know what you're really thinking right now. I never did. Do you guys ever do that? You meet someone, you're at a discipleship group, you're hanging out at coffee, whatever, someone's sharing in the back of your mind, you're kind of a discerning person and you're, you're thinking, well, I know what, they're, what they really mean. Anybody ever do that? That's the assessment of motives. That's what he's talking about here, okay? So he's saying that for him, as a minister of the gospel, when he gets up to preach, he's not concerned at all with, with what people think about him. There's three types of evaluation that he's not concerned with. In fact, let me just roll through these with you real quick. I think you'll find them a little bit humorous, actually. Three types of evaluation that he's just not concerned with as a preacher of the gospel. Number one is the, the congregational evaluation. In fact, you could write that down there in your notes. You'll notice in verse 3, it's at the bottom of the list. Do you see it? Look, he says, but to me, it's a very small thing that I should be examined by you, which I find is really funny. He's just looking at the church and going, you know what, I don't really care what you think. It's a pretty small thing, to be honest, to him. It's at the bottom of the list. I think he starts with that because he knows that congregations at churches can be mean and they, they can make it really hard on a preacher. I have buddies who quit because people are so mean to them. Right? You guys are always nice to me, but people can be mean. You remember the, the old story about William? He was at home and he was sleeping. Remember that story? And he was, he was fast asleep on a Sunday morning and his mom started rapping on the door. She said, William, you need to get up. Remember this one? So William said, no, I don't want it. She said, it's Sunday morning. You got to get to church. You got to get up. He said, no, I don't want it. She said, you got to. He said, why? She said, well, first, because you're 40 years old. And second, because you're the pastor. <laughs> That's pastor humor. But I don't know if you'd believe this or not, but there's actually some Sundays where I don't want to be here. You're like, no. Are there some Sundays where you don't want to be here? But you come because you're faithful? Yeah, you know, I've had Sundays, not so much anymore. There were Sundays in the early days where literally half the crowd looking at me I knew didn't like me at all. And you know how you know? Because they show you. <laughs> now, let me just give you, Stuart Briscoe wrote a book on this years ago. Let me give you three things about congregations, okay, that tend to happen. Number one, this is why Paul says you can't worry about what everyone thinks, is sometimes congregations just praise you. Sometimes congregants just praise. You know, most Christians are super nice and they, they heap it on and they, they tell you how much they love you. That could be dangerous because then it goes to your head. And so you walk around thinking, I'm the man. You got to learn. Paul says, I don't, I, don't, I don't consider that. He says, you got to learn to make sure that you answer the angry email the same way or the nice email the same way you answer the angry email and you don't let it sink in. That can't be something that you think about. Because often congregations are not praising you. You ready? It's not congregational praise. It's a congregational ploy. There are people in the church who want to use the leadership structure and their influence and their wealth and their money to try to get you, instead of being a servant of Christ, to become a servant of the board or of the denomination. And Paul says you can't let it happen. And they're always manipulating. I could tell you some stories on that one. But even more so, sometimes it's not that congregants are, are praised or congregants ploy, it's that they just flat out are, are painful. They just want to cut you down and they're antagonistic and they rub it right in your face. It happens all the time. I remember my daddy, first church in Cincinnati, Ohio, Westwood, his first sermon, he got up to preach and he finished and he walked out into the lobby and Ed Sauer came up behind him and he crossed his arms and he said, Gene, pastor, 
He said, I want you to know, he's got like a 30-person family behind him. He said, I've been this church a long time, Pastor, and I just want you to know, I got enough power, I don't always get what I do like, but I can always stop what I don't. And some of you are going, there's nobody like that in church. Oh, yes, there is. Now, let me ask you a question. Just be honest with me. Do you go to places that you don't like to go? I don't. I don't like Disneyland for many reasons. I'm not even being sociocultural right now. I'm just saying I don't like Disneyland because it's sweaty and humid and there's a lot of people and I don't like standing in line. So guess what? I don't go to Disneyland. Do you go to Disneyland? Sorry, some people are, that's your thing. <laughs> right? Let me ask you a question. I've seen it over the years. Somebody doesn't like the church, they don't want to be at the church, and every time I talk to them, they share a grudge about the church. Can I ask you a question? Why does that individual still come to that church? Do you think God put them there? And if God didn't put them there, then who put, might have put them there? See? It happens. So Paul says, listen, I'm not buying into all that. I'm not playing the game. I mean, Paul says, I care, but I, but I don't care. Because I don't serve you, I serve him, Paul says. And then he goes on from the congregational evaluation. Look at this one, number two, to what I'm, I'm calling the societal evaluation. Look at it in verse three. He calls it the human court. I love that. Look at it again in verse 3. But to me, it's a very small thing that I should ever be examined by you or by any human court. Now he's moving outside the church and he's moving kind of into society, uh, kind of the, the peer pressure of the public. <laughs> so, you know, what, just answer me. Be honest. What, what is the stereotype of pastors these days? How does society view ministers of the gospel? How do you think? I mean, the pendulum has swung. Tell me if I'm wrong. The pendulum has swung way over here where I think pastors by and large now are viewed as like effeminate, metrosexual, by, think about Hollywood, little softies who have a lisp when they talk and they stand there at weddings and they're, you know, and you be wed and God join together, let no man ever step away and, uh, and go and be holy. And then like they end up getting like kicked and booted across the table in the banquet hall and they're wearing their little frock collar. That, I mean, am I not right? It's like a pedantic, mediocre, small-minded little schlub who's just there to you know, get his 200 bucks for doing the wedding. That's the view. Or the pendulum swings all the way over this way and there's a pressure on what? The pastor who actually does stand for something. And he's pressed on like, 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 he's, like he's a problem for the community. I mean, we had a guy who is uh, in the church who's running for office and he was at lunch with a senator and they were brainstorming and talking about all the great things they're gonna do. And suddenly the senator paused and he said, but I got a question. What are we gonna do about your troublemaking pastor? I'm not a troublemaker. <laughs> I'm, I'm a nice guy. I've got kids and wives and I, I play... I, This is not Utah. <laughs> I have children and a wife, and a wife, and a wife. And I was going to say I play two square or four square with my son. But what is that? Do you notice what's happening? You're either going to swing the pendulum over to he's, he's an effeminate metrosexual who stands for nothing, or else you're rough on our feathers. And you got to, you know, I'll tell you what I, what I told that man on the phone. I said, it's a good thing I don't run for office. I don't want your votes. No minister of the gospel is trying to get votes. We're not in politics. We don't serve the people. We serve Christ. See, that's the point. That's why it feels like troublemaking for those that are trying to aggrandize themselves to the masses. So he moves from congregational evaluation to societal evaluation. Look at this one. This one blows my mind. Look at this. Personal evaluation. You see it there in verse 3? He says, or by any human court. In fact, I don't even examine myself. Now, now, some of you are going, that's impossible. What does that mean? Does that mean he doesn't even think? No, he does. 2 Corinthians 13, 5, Romans 7. Paul's very much aware of his sin. And what he does is he says, if it's a real sin, deal with it. Cut it off. 
Hebrews 12, 1 and 2, kick it out of your life. It's a hindrance and an entanglement so that you can run. He's not talking about all that. He's talking about that overtly introspective deal that, that the preachers are common to where it's like, I'm going to sit and I'm going to do yoga. And I'm going to try to dig down into the depths of who I am to find out if what I'm doing is right or wrong. And he says, listen, just get up and go for it. Because you're paralyzed. It's a paralysis of analysis, man. You think about it. If you spend the rest of the 30 years of your life and all you're doing is digging down into your little deceitful heart trying to find out what's right and wrong, you're going to spend the entire ministry career focused on you instead of on people. What a horrific way to live. So he says, get over it. I'm mean, going to give you a quintessential example of that. Ten years ago, I was invited to go to a retreat. I got to the retreat, and I found out it was this wild at heart thing. Some of you know about that. What you do, a bunch of dudes go up to a, a cabin somewhere. You sit around a fire pit, and then they told me, get this, they told me I was supposed to go off to um, a, 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 the hillside for an entire Saturday and just sit there with a journal and try to listen and hear the voice of God. Now, let me tell you, I didn't, I didn't hear nothing. I heard birds, and I, I, I heard my own burping. I heard a stream. See, if, if men of God would simply get off the mountains trying to hear the voice of God and spend Monday through Friday opening the word of God, then they would know the truth of God and be able to live for God. God already spoke. See, you understand that when someone says to you, hey, I've got a word from the Lord, you open up the Bible and say, show it to me. Show it to me. Because he spoke right here. See, what we got to do as men is garner what it means to live by habits. Where, where I get in the word every morning and I ask God what he wants to, to show me and the spirit illuminates that off the page and I, I roll with that because it's memorized and it's meditated on because he's already given me the truth that will take me from here to heaven. He says, minister of God, don't spend all your time just sitting around wondering what's in you. Spend your time preaching about me. Friends of ministers got to balance caring but not caring. You know, I always picture it like this. Let me just be honest with you. I, I picture it like you, you want your minister to have the heart of a puppy. You know, we have a puppy, Pepper, and he's like so cute, you know, and she's kind of ugly, but I pretend like she's cute. You, you, want, you want him to have the heart of a puppy. You know, puppies are loyal, and they're right there, and they're positive, and they're like, I'm here for you. But then you also want him to have the hide of a rhino. Where, where, where the congregational pressure and the societal pressure and even his personal pressure is not constantly making him one of those, those sails in the wind who's constantly bouncing and flailing back and forth. That's, that's what, what Paul was. That's Paul. Which leads us here to a great question, right? Well, if he's not listening to the congregation on everything, he's not listening to the society, he's not listening to even himself, here's the question. What keeps him on track? Who is he listening to? In verse 4, he gives the answer. You see it? He says, For I am conscious of nothing against myself, yet I am not even by that acquitted. He says, Even if I don't feel I've done anything wrong, that doesn't matter. That's not the final verdict. All right? But who is? Look at verse 4. But the one who examines me is who? You got it out? It's the Lord. He says, Listen, the one type of evaluation I'm concerned with is the Lord. So verse 5, he gives us a therefore. Therefore, don't go passing judgment before the time, but wait until the Lord comes who will bring both to light the things hidden in the dark and disclose the motive of men's hearts and each man's praise will come to him from God. You know the simplest way to understand that? You know, we've been talking about the Bema seat, the tribunal, where we're all gonna stand before Christ and give an account of these on the body, both good and bad. What he's saying is, 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 is don't do dry runs and dress rehearsals for that on earth because none of you are qualified to do it. So whether it's a pastor, whether it's a congregant, whether it's each other, you don't walk around going, well, I know what you really think and I know what you're all about. You just don't do it because only Christ is the one who knows everything. He knows not only the what, but also the why. He says, don't, just don't, don't do it. See, and then he gives those three lines. Jesus will bring to light the things hidden. That's not the, the sin. That's all judged at the cross. One day, all the secret stuff is gonna be exposed and he says, Jesus will disclose the motives of the heart He's not going to judge our diplomas and our books and our writing and our preaching style and our church size and our converts. He's going to judge the motives of every minister. And then look at this. Jesus will give each man his praise. It's not punishment. That was all dealt with at the cross. The only punishment, we talked about that a few weeks ago, will be silence, where it's like, oh, I should have done so much more. But every true faithful minister is going to receive some level, I love that word of praise, 
where Christ walks over. And by the way, this is for all Christians. Imagine that moment. Anybody here have anything that they, they think was like, you nailed it? You, you nailed some things? Okay, nobody's ready to raise their hand on that one. Okay, here's what I think is going to happen. There's some things in our life where we feel like we nailed it, and what we're going to find is those are burned and forgotten. And then there's going to be some things where we had forgotten about them, and Jesus is going to walk over, and he's going to say, that right there, that was praiseworthy. Which means that in heaven, the, the hallowed halls are going to be filled with the applause of men and women of which you and I have never heard. I mean, we're talking like, a man in a hut in a third world village who served faithfully for 45 years, a grandma who served faithfully at VBS for all those years, and the hallowed halls of heaven are going to fill with the praise of people we've never heard of. I think we always tend to think in heaven, it's going to be like, oh, there's that guy. There's J-Mac, right? There's John MacArthur, right? And Jesus is like, no, no, he's way over there. This is Matilda. <laughs> this way we... Because he's judging the, he's not, it's not about all the stuff, it's about like this. I remember um, the first time I met Pastor B.J. Payata. Uh, he, he's, he's like five foot one, short guy, Filipino man. We were in the Philippines, in Manila, and someone said, there's this church that you just have to visit. So Bree and I, we had, it was Bree and my little one-year-old Ethan. And so they packed us into a van, and get this, they took us out of the city and we go around this long stretch until we arrive at the, at the landfill of this second world nation. Now, if you've never seen a landfill, or maybe you've seen one here, this is different. This is like, you know the mountains we have out here? What's the one down by, is it Saddleback? Is that what it's called? Okay. You, you know the, the mountains that we have. Literally, this landfill is mountains of trash. To the point that they would fall on villages because villages are built underneath them and then they would just put a marker up and say 55 people died here or whatever. Now here's the thing. We come around the corner, we get out of the van and they take us into this, 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 this like winding road. It's all dirt. There's little roosters running back and forth. And then all of a sudden in the middle of this mountainous landfill, they said, hey, there's the village. And so we come around the corner and all these homes are built into the trash. Because in a second or third world nation, if you don't have money, there's nowhere to get food. You, you have to go to the landfill. And so Bree and I, and we're taking, we're taking our little baby with us. And there's these, have you guys ever seen banana spiders? You know, the ones that are like this big, as big as your head. And they're up in the wires. And I'm thinking, this is like Indiana Jones and I'm going to die. And we come around the corner. And, and, and all of a sudden, Pastor Payada comes running out. And he's, he's five feet tall, happy Filipino. And he comes over and goes, hey, guys, I want you to see all my people. I said, your people? And then one by one, house by house, he takes us into these little hovels where it's a mama and she's got her baby and literally the walls on the back side of the hut is just, it's just trash. And every morning they would get up and send the kids out to the landfill and they'd come back with their banana peels and whatever it was and they would cook with their one little chicken in there. And then Pastor Payada said, I'll, I want to show you something. We were able to build a church. I'm like, a church? And we go around the corner, and there's this concrete slab, and there's no walls. It was just a tin roof. And he walks in, and he was beaming with joy. And he said, this is our brand new church building. And I'm looking around. It's like the size, literally the size of the stage. And he said, hold on, we have a surprise. And all of a sudden, I start hearing feet and I hear singing. And he said, our congregation is coming today because they wanted to pray for you guys. And they come around the corner and here's these people. They are beat up. They've got marks on their faces. Their hair is bedraggled. And they come into their church building. And then they took us and they sat us right in the middle of this little church building. And there's a whole circle of 40 people around. And one by one, I'll tell you, they start praying that our ministry in California would grow and that God would bless everything we're doing here. And I'm sitting there and I have like crocodile-sized tears that are just hitting the pavement because I'm going, oh my goodness, God, these are Christians. So we stand up after an hour of them praying for us and we're heading out to the van and then the driver says, oh, by the way, you need to know something about Pastor Payata. He said, um... He just contracted lung cancer. 
And I said, well, oh, I'm so sorry. He said, well, actually, it's because of all the carcinogens that are here in the acidic air of the landfill. And his doctor told him five years ago that if he didn't stop doing this, he would get cancer in his lungs. And he's kept doing it and serving anyway because he loves these people so much. And friends, I will tell you, I have never forgotten that man. And I have never forgotten that little shanty church and those hovels and huts because I feel like I actually saw this. The halls of heaven are going to be filled with the applause of men and women of whom the world has never heard and never known.